Yo yo grinders, what's up? Uh, welcome back to But What's Your Range, the series where we go through the range by range approach to having a good solid strategy in your No Limit Holding 6 Max game. Um, we're going to continue what we're doing today, do a bit more analysis on a little bit more maths, a little bit more analysis on what ranges are optimal in certain spots. And today we're going to be focusing on big blind versus button situations. And the stakes I'm focusing on are 50 NL. A little disclaimer, um, the population reads I'm going to use this time uh, to form these reads on I'm not totally sure about because I have not played 50 NL in a while and I'm not exactly sure how the regulars are playing these days but I've picked out a population read that I kind of remember from back in the day when I used to grind 50s. And you guys can tell me if that's right or not. But I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not, it's not really so important um, for me to get the population reads exactly right for each stake because um, you guys who are playing 50 NL should have a much better idea what those population reads should be than I do. More importantly is just that I'm able to show you guys how to form a range to combat each type of you know regular at your stakes and each kind of position and what your ranges should look like and how you could how you can form those based on the population population reads that you do have. So we've got a good old cartoon again today. I was going to tweak some stuff and change it, but I'm kind of running out of time, so apologies. I was going to update the conversation. And I don't know, maybe have this guy say, well, actually, my range is this, and come back and refute this guy that you just love to punch in the face. Like, if someone stuck their head out at you like that in real life and was that annoying, would you not just really have to hit them? Like, what else could you possibly do? I don't think there'd be much option there, to be honest. It's kind of like only one play. I mean, how annoying... So we're going to help this little blonde kid devise his ranges today and help him become better at 3-betting in the spot of being in the big blind against the button. So we're going to start off by looking at an old friend of ours. Um, so this is episode 3, not episode 4. There we go. So remember the Spectrum. Spectrum is an old... Um, An old friend of ours from way back in the day, characters video like 40 or something from way back then, maybe. I'm totally guessing it might be like 60 or 70, I have no idea. But um, this was basically where I first coined this idea, um, and I decided that the best way to divide up your 3-bet ranges when we don't have any other information is to sort of rank them in, four, in a spectrum with four segregated bits. At the strongest end in the green, you're going to get your 3-bit value hands, your stuff like aces, your queens, your kings, your ace-king, the hands that you're always going to be able to 3-bet, especially in late position wars. How many hands go in there depends on how wide your opponent calls. Obviously, the more your opponent is calling you, the more hands should be slotted in there, as we'll see when we start designing some of these ranges as well. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the gist of it. The hands you call are going to be your strong hands that are good enough to call with, but you think that you know if you 3-bet them, you're not going to be doing too well against your opponent's continuing range, so they're good enough to call, but not good enough to 3-bet from value. But if they're good enough to call, then in my opinion, most of the time, because I favour a polarised 3-bet range for the most part, especially when we don't have any reason to do otherwise, I think that if a hand's good enough to call, then it should be a call, or it should be a 3-bet for value if it's good enough for that. But you shouldn't really be turning hands that are profitable calls too often into 3-bet bluffs, there might be some exceptions, but for the most part you really want to be 3-betting hands that are too weak to call, and that way the idea of the spectrum is that you're kind of maximising those those most right three segments, the orange, the yellow and the green, you're maximising what goes in there by putting each hand into its correct place, and that way you're not sort of using up calling hands as 3-bet bluffs, because the assumption is here that you're only going to have a set allocation of 3-bet bluffing hands, because like you saw before, we want our ranges to be somewhat balanced. We don't want to be 3-bet bluffing like way, way, way more often than we're 3-betting for value unless we're against complete nets that don't adjust or something. So we want to fill up all these spots with as many hands as we can, and we want that fold um, segment to be as small as possible, and that's why we want to keep the calling hands as calls, and we can use as many of those folds as we can, or non-calls as we can, as 3-bet bluffs, and then fold the rest We fold the remainder. Our fold range is obviously still going to be substantial. We don't want to be like massive stations or massive habitual 4-betters, 3-bets, unless we've got a very good reason to be. Um, but yeah, we want it to be as small as we possibly can. So that's the idea behind the spectrum. And when we design our 3-bet ranges today using the sort of GTO, more math-based approach, we're going to be keeping this in mind and still holding on to our spectrumish values, basically, that we've used before. So... 
what I want to talk about first is last time we touched on um, doing a little equity calc to find out how we could make someone's light five betting unprofitable. We, we sort of designed the situation where our range made it bad for them to be three bet five betting with hands like ace queen button versus small blind against us. Now we're moving to the big blind today just to show you guys that uh, because the flatting aspect is more interesting from the big blind, you can flat a lot more hands basically. When you're in a small blind, you often have to be very tight or have no flatting range if there's squeezes ahead of you and things like that. In the big blinds, you're getting better pot odds, isn't? you're never going to get squeezed, you're closing the action, you know, you're going to have a lot more opportunities to just be able to flat, which is nice. So we're going to look at that today since part of the focus is how we divide up our flatting range from our 3-bit bluffing range and all of that. So we're looking to refute some light 4 bettors today. Um, People who generally four bet too much, and one of my population reads for fifty and L is that people tend to fold a lot at first, and then don't really know how to adjust properly to light three betting, and tend to go into habitual four betting mode very quickly, and this results in them making a really large over adjustment. It makes their rings very face up and very sort of easy to readjust against, and it's probably not very optimal. So, with that in mind, you know we want to know how we can refute light four bettors. So. Our aim is, can we construct a 3 betting range that allows us to be shoving over 4 bets often enough so that we render any 4 bet bluff minus EV versus us while still getting villains to 4 bet bluff a lot. So obviously, again, we need to find this fine sort of balance between not tightening up our bluffing range so much that people stop messing with our 3 bets because we want them to do that too much. We think this is a mistake that goes on at 50 and out. People do 4 bet bluff in the wrong spots and too much and too suddenly and don't make enough other adjustments. We want them to do that. That's a mistake. Um, so we don't want to stop 3-bit bluffing or far from it. What we want to do is just bring our percentages of value hands to, you know, hands that we can 5-bet all in to be closer to the hands that we're having to 3-bet fold so that their 4-bets aren't working enough of the time. But to know what that percentage is that we need to aim for or aim above, what we need to do is find out how often their 4-bet bluffs need to work. And what I've done is used another sort of case model here. Um, I've done the old two to min opening on the button is pretty standard in these games, so that's pretty much the size that I'm focusing on here. You can later on we're gonna do some three bet ranges that involve actually um three Xing uh, combating like three X opens and what do we three bet against that and you know it's gonna be different and things like that obviously because we're getting a totally different price and the ranges shouldn't be as wide in the 3x and, and all these kind of things really. So anyway, let's just try and construct a range that allows us to do well against people who habitually are 4-betting us far too much. Okay, so here's our model. Our 4-bet is going to be a 16 big blind. Their 4-bet sorry, is going to be a 16 big blind 4-bet over our 7.5 big blind 3-bet that we make from out of position. So to find out how often this 4-bet bluff needs to work in order for them to break even from it, then we need to use our old friend the bet divided by bet plus pot equation, which is a good equation in poker because it seems to cover lots and lots of different things. It's also the same equation you use here if you want to figure out how often you should call a bet on the river or something like that or you should call an all in on any street use bet over bet plus pot. It's the same when you want to work out how, how much fold equity you need with a bluff. So if you didn't know that, that's definitely something to make sure you remember. It's very useful when you're doing your analysis and that kind of thing. So Villain risks an additional 14 big blinds here. This is because he's already open for two. So when we're working out his amount needed amount of fold equity needed to break even, what we need to do is take the situation from when he's actually piling in that 4-bet and not be counting the money that's happened already. That's a different street. That is dead money in the pot now as far as his EV for that one play in that situation is concerned. So his 4-bet doesn't take into account the fact that he's already lost those two big blinds. The entire play does if you take the EV of his whole line, but that's different and that's not we're doing it at his decision point where he chooses the 4-bet because that's relevant to whether his 4-bet is good it's no longer relevant whether or not he lost that two big blinds before, okay? So that's why the amount he's risking here, or the bet, is going to be 14 big blinds, not 16, because he's making a 16 total, and he's already put in two, so we'll just clarify that for you guys. Um, and he's trying to win our 7.5 big blind three bet, his two big blind open that's dead money in part of the pot, and also the 0 0.5 big blinds from the small blind. Um, 
which is dead money, of course, we're assuming the, the small blind folds in this scenario gets way too complicated, way too fast if we try and incorporate that in, but I challenge you guys to do some work on those spots as well if you want. So it needs to work 14 over 10 plus 14 a minute at a time, which is just bet into bet plus pot, as we've worked it out here. Then we times it by 100 to make it into a percentage, and we get the answer that this 4-bet needs to work 58.33% of the time. And this is a quite standard amount for 4-bets to need to work. Depends on the sizing paradigm that you've got going on, but usually they're going to need to work somewhere between 55 and 60% of the time. That's pretty normal for 4-bets if they're sized correctly. And here's a little side point. This is why it's very important to size your 4-bets correctly, because if you make them too big in position, then your value has probably still achieved the same thing. But now your bluffs need to work like over 60% and they're obviously just doing much worse there. So yeah, if he's sizing correctly here then, or what I think is correct, then 58.33 is the amount of fold equity he needs. So our aim now is can we make a 3-bet range that allows us to be folding to 4-bets a good bet less than this? We don't want his bluffs to work that often because otherwise his strategy of 4-betting all the time is actually going to be good because they're all going to be plus EV 4-bets against our range. However, if we can make these really quite bad, then that's awesome for us. But we also want to keep our three bet range fairly wide because we don't want him to be able to just adjust and realize that we've stopped three betting very much. That's probably what he wants by four betting. We don't want to do that. We just want to make his four bets bad. So let's shoot for jamming 50% of our three bet range instead of 58. Instead of, um, so we're folding 50% of our three bet range, not 58% of our three bet range. That's going to be very good for us. That's going to. I haven't worked out the EV calc here. You can do it. I challenge you to do that using the same method we used in episode two. Um, go for it. And we fun little exercise. Um, so we need a one to one ratio. If we want fifty percent three bit folds and fifty percent three bit jams, then of course we want a one to one ratio of three bit jams versus three bit folds. But here's the catch. We think if our 3-bet percentage drops too low, then villain will make a good adjustment and stop 4-betting too much, and then that sucks because we've just lost our edge. Our strategy was going to be really good against him as long as he keeps 4-betting us too much because our range isn't geared to refute that. But if he stops doing that, then we've just lost all that work. So we need to be careful in forming this range that we don't make it too tight, that we don't that we have enough combos in there that we're still 3-bet bluffing a decent percentage, you know, that that figure is still a high number on his HUD. I'm going to go with 8% here. might seem arbitrary, but I think 8% is kind of where people look at your 3-bet and think, yeah, that, that guy's 3-betting a fair whack. Whereas if it's like 6%, that's definitely fairly low. So I think 8% is a good, a good amount to aim for. So what does that mean if we want to be 3-betting 8% of hands when he opens and we're in the big blind? Well, it means that of all the possible hole cards we can be dealt, we want 8% of them to be in our 3-bet range. And we know already that magic number 1326, that's how many hole cards there are. Combination of, combinations of hole cards there are, sorry. So we want to be 3-betting 8% of those, which is 107 combinations of hole cards. So right away, we've gone from not knowing how to play against this guy, not knowing what our ranges should look like, to knowing that it's really good for us if we have 107 combos in our range and half of those are 3-bet folds and half of those are 3-bet champs. This is now taking shape. It should be quite easy to achieve. So let's go ahead and create this range for ourselves, yeah? Why not? Okay. So let's do it. I have to sit forward in my seat there. I was quite comfortable just leaning back, ranting. So now I have to get my hand on the mouse and actually bring up Poker Cruncher. I always forget the name of that application for some reason. I want to call it Equilab, but that's something else. Okay, so what we want here is a 4-bit range that is about 54, 53 combos and a value range that's about 54 combos. Okay, so far so good. So first we want a value range of 54 combos. How are we going to do that? Well, let's start off with the obvious. If we give ourselves Ace, King and Jets Plus, then let's count our combos. We should be getting good at this by now. We know that there are 6 combos of all these pairs by 4 is 24 and we know that Ace, King is 16 so we know that's 40 combos. Not quite enough, right? we want 54 combos. So we're looking for another 14 combos. Sure. Okay, well, what if we then give ourselves pens? There's another six right there. So now we're only needing eight more combos. And then we can give ourselves ace queen suited. Okay, now we're only needing four more combos. 
the best hand to jam here. Um, nines is probably good. Nines is a hand that's going to have some decent equity. Gives us a little bit more than the amount we need, but that's okay. Let's go a little bit over our estimate here. Let's give ourselves nines as well. We'll, we'll just 3-bet jam. Nines plus, ace-king plus, and ace-queen suited in this spot. And that's a kind of wider value range than we've seen before, but it's geared towards the fact that we want him to make this mistake of 4-bet folding lots, right? That's definitely what we want to happen. Okay. Cool. So we've got that. We've got all these hands here. Our six. Let's just count up all the combos once more for good measure. We've got six pairs times six is 36. We've got our 16 of ace king, which makes 50. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's six combos of pairs, which would be 36 combos. Ace king is 16, which is 52. And ace queen suited is four, which is fifty six. Okay, so we're only just over our sort of target here. So we've achieved fifty six value combos. So we want to aim for about the same now in bluffs, and that range is a nice little range of nine nine plus. This is how we write ranges, by the way. Um, ace queen suited plus ace king offsuit. Ace queen suited plus includes ace king suited, and then we have ace king offsuit in there as well. So that's how we write that range, just in case you're wondering. Okay, so you don't usually use two different kinds of brackets, so that's just like a little bit odd by me. So let's now shoot for that many bluffs, roughly. If we're a little bit off, it's not going to be a big deal. It's important that the range is kind of easy to remember and isn't like, you know, roll a dice and on a one or five you can three bet the hand and otherwise you can't. I think if you can avoid having to use randomization, then that's good. I mean, there are spots where I think randomization is a pretty cool way to go, but that's another story. I think a spot like this, where you're like three bet jamming, you just want to have a set amount of hands, basically. Okay, so let's go on to our three bet bluff range then. Firstly, we kind of need to know what our flatting range is. I'm going to bypass this just now um, and say that these king hands are really good for us to bluff because we're going to do a lot of work on flatting ranges in a minute, okay? So all these suited kings are pretty nice that we're not able to flat against the button open, say. So that's seven combos, seven types of those hands, four combos that pop is going to be 28. We give ourselves some suited aces as well. I mean, we can flat our better suited aces, but let's say we three bet these ones, and then we flat ace eight suited them better. Up towards our value range of ace queen, of course. When we start 3 bet again, for a different reason, we're then in the green part of the spectrum again. So this is the orange part of the spectrum, you know, our bluffs that we're working on right now. Okay, so right off the bat we have 13 combos of 3 bet bluffs right here. Um, this might not even be optimal, like all these kings, to be honest. I don't know why I'm like obsessing on blockers, it's not actually so important if we're not 4 betting. Let me start that again, right. So let's add these. And let's add like some suited connectors and things. These are going to be quite nice. Ones that we're not flatting. Um, so something like this. Maybe some suited gappers is pretty cool too. So already that's 12. 12 by 4, 48 combos. What do we need? We need another 8 combos or so to equal it out. What's the most playable stuff we aren't flatting in here? Probably flatting these things like suited connectors this good. Um, we can probably use something like queen 9, queen 8. Okay. So then we've given ourselves 14 different suited hands, 4 combos a pop. Um, is that 14? 6, 10, 15. 15 suited hands at 4 combos a pop is going to be 60. We want 56. So, yeah, we want 14. 5, 2, 3. Sorry, that is 14. It's just the Queen 7 here isn't actually highlighted. It just looks like it is. So that's our... Ignore the Queen 7 suited. That's just orange because my mouse is on it. So... This can be our, our bluffing range here, and we can write that in. I'm not going to bother to save time, but you can write that in, um, you know, as it's here, ace 2 to ace 7 suited, blah, blah, blah. And that's how it's got 56 combos, and then if we use that range, we've achieved our aim of making his 4 red bluffs really, really good, and we should be playing pretty well against that guy. So that's that range done. So now we're going to look at some sizing things on the button and look at some generic ranges for how we're going to play against different sizes with this same population read. We've got well, we've got this read here, 15 hour regs tend to fold at first and then suddenly over adjust to like 3 betting by folding, by 4 bet folding too much. So basically we've got the same population read, but we're now going to like incorporate our flattening ranges and things like that 
and we're going to see how it changes against a 3x open and a 2x open. Some cats are causing some chaos in the background. I think they know that when I'm talking and making a video, I'm less likely to come and like scream at them when they're destroying things. So they're pretty smart that way. Let's reset all of this. Okay, so a reg is gonna a reg who fits that basic population read profile, right? He seems like a non-passive, non-netty regular, so he probably fits the profile that we've outlined, or well, a lot of the time is opening in the button and we want to we want to design ranges that we can use to play against this guy well. So firstly we want to look at well I think we've already decided that against the against the three X, right? Let's do our flatting our flatting range first. And we'll bear in mind that we want like roughly like the fifty six combos of air and fifty six combos of value. We've already sort of or 56 combos of bluffs and 56 combos of value, we've already sort of worked that out and we can use that in this exercise as well. So if we're making a flatting range here, right, what hands can we flat against someone? Let's say he's opening like a standard amount, like 40-50% on the button, okay, and he's 3xing, um, what kind of hands do we want to be flatting against that? Or what hands can we flat with against that? Okay, so it, it kind of does depend on what we 3-bet for value. So against the 3x, let's give ourselves that same kind of range here. Our value range was this. So that's our value range. Then our bluffing range is, our uh, flatting range is going to be like stuff that does not include these hands, obviously. So we can probably flat 8s and 7s, but we want to be very wary about these small pairs. I've talked about this before. Um, we generally want to be avoiding flatting these against 3x button opens because our price is not very good so our implied odds are bad because of that and also because of the fact that he's opening you know 40-50% of hands so when we do flop sets we can't really do very well and thirdly when we don't flop sets we have a terrible third pair or second pair hand that's just going to get worse and worse on most run outs and has poor equity to improve with only two outs when it misses so these hands are just kind of bad so let's only flat like the best sort of pairs here I think that's a good way to go in terms of our broadways, we can of course flat some things that are going to dominate them, so we probably want things like all of this, all the hands that aren't quite good enough for us to be 3-betting for value can be in there. Queen, Jack, offsuit, I mean Queen 10 and Jack 10 are maybe a little bit loose against the 3x, we might want to fold those or incorporate them into our, our bluffing range, but probably not, we can probably just fold hands that week. Um, so we want to flat stuff like that, and then I think we can flat a lot of the better suited aces here as well. So like ace jack through ace eight, it's going to be fine. Um, we want to be flatting probably king ten, king jack suited, king queen suited for sure. These hands are just going to play very well against our opponent's range because it's wide, and these hands are very playable suited connectors. We probably want to be in there as well. Okay, so we flat a range like that basically. That's that's it in a nutshell. That's the amount that we're flatting, 10.6% of hands. And then we're going to be value betting, like, value 3 betting, jamming this range. And then we're going to be, if you remember our bluff range from before, we can just plug that in. And that's basically how we're going to look to play against, against this guy. Okay, so now what we want to do is... Think about how this changes against the min rates, and this is where things start to get pretty interesting, right? Because now our flattening range is going to increase in size, and it's we can leave our value range the same and still say that we want these 56 combos, right? So we'll do that, we'll leave our value range exactly the same here because we still have the same ambition against his min raising. We're going to assume he still four bets too much, it's still the same over adjustment he's making or these player types are making, so we still want to be having a fairly wide value range here. Firstly, it's also good just because if he does decide to flat, then we've got more of a value range. We don't have bluffs so often, we've widened our value range. And that's cool if he wants to flat loads of random broadways or lower pairs and things like that. We're going to be doing very well against him, crushing him in a lot of cases. But mainly it's good for our aim, which is to exploit the fact that he is four betting us too much and too mindlessly. So we keep the same value range there, 56 combos. Then our flatting range is going to become a lot wider and if you remember the spectrum what's actually going to happen here is that it's going to encroach upon our 3-bet bluff hands. Against the 3x you can see that this yellow 
this yellow bit here is going to be shrunken, right? That's going to be like maybe only only this size or something. This is a terrible last minute sort of rendition with a big massive pen I'm using to do this. Apologies for the, the nastiness of this. So this whole bit here, this, this bit here is going to be a part that we can't really be flattening against the 3x open because it's too big. But then when he starts min-raising, this can all become our flattening range here. And what's happened is that the 3-bit bluff range has then become smaller and we don't have enough combos in that anymore. Therefore, it has to start eating into the folding range to make up its combos because too many of them have already been confiscated by this calling range. The calling range has grown and consumed the 3-bit bluff range because of the odds it's getting. It wants to grow. It naturally does that. Therefore, the 3-bit bluff range finds itself short of hands. It keeps maybe the worst hands in its range, but it's looking around now thinking, shit, I don't have enough hands. I need to steal some from this folding range. And the folding range is happy to give those away because it doesn't want to have many hands in it because no one likes to fold. So that's how the spectrum is going to handle this situation, right? So back to the back to our um, poker cruncher. You recall before that we had all these suited aces in our um, three bit bluff range because they weren't quite good enough to flat get a bad price against the three x. But against two x, um, we don't really need to do even very well from the blinds in order to defend against the min open. This is because our loss rate in the blinds is usually negative one hundred big blinds per one hundred if we fold everything. So all we need to do is lose less than negative one hundred big blinds per one hundred hands in order for us to be you know, doing well in this situation. So hopefully there are a lot of hands that we can lose far less than that with when we play out of position here. Only having to call one big blind more. You know, if we called a big blind more and then folded every flop, we'd still only be losing negative 200 BB per 100, which is bad, but like, it's not like massively, massively worse than what we're aiming for, it's only double as bad. But then, of course, our value comes in the fact that we're not going to be folding every single flop, we're going to be making a lot of money in a lot of cases, and that should make our play, if not plus EV, then certainly less negative EV than folding from the big blind, which is why we can defend, that's a rant about why we can defend with a wider range here. So, these hands are all going to be in there. I would say that, you know, we can probably flat, like, of course, these ones are still in here as well, that we're not comfortable through making for value. We can probably flat like any suited king as well to a min open. We can flat a lot of our suited queens too. And we can flat some of our better suited jacks, certainly some tens. You'll notice there's a sort of weird shape going on here. That's because the lower we go down in the hand order, the worse things get. But also the less connected they are, the worse things get. That's why there's like a disparity here where you know, queen to six equals jack six equals ten six, and then we're calling ten seven but not jack six. We're calling jack seven but not queen six. It's about connectedness and also the size of the cards that make it, that make them less or more playable. Um, all our suited connectors are probably now these ones that we were three bank before. So what you'll see here is actually that we're finding that our entire um, our entire bit bluff range has been swallowed into the calling range and so it's basically having to grab a whole new set of hands to 3-bet from the fold and the overall consequence of this is that well we're playing more hands against the min raise than we are against the 3x which is exactly what we want we're flattening many more hands and this is exactly the result that we're looking for so this is good so far so good back to our analysis so there's probably even some of these suited gappers that were okay, like calling down to like 7-5 probably wouldn't be terrible or anything. Then we've got all our offsuit stuff still, we still want to be calling all our good stuff. Any Broadway now is going to be a slam dunk call, we're not going to full jack 10 offsuit now to have min open, certainly not. Um, our pairs, probably any pair we can now defend, it's not like amazing or anything, but we're getting such a good price now to try and flop a set or just pick up the pot. Post flop again. Remember, we don't need to be doing that well here. We just need to be doing better than folding, and folding's very bad. So we can defend wider. And uh, one of the most common mistakes people make is they're just not calling wide enough here. You can even call them any ace. Okay, so let's say we call any ace. We call like even like king eight, queen eight, 
half suit. So now we're defending like loads of hands, like 36.2% of hands were just flatting when he opens the big blind. This is going to make his his open kind of bad. Remember, he's giving himself a very good price to try and take down the blind, so it's kind of important strategically that we don't just fold everything, that we make that difficult for him to actually achieve. Okay, so this is going to be our flatting range. So now our spectrum is now grasping our folding hands here to try and we'll be looking at these kind of hands here and we're looking for our 56 combos so let's start with these kind of hands these seem to be the best like any the suited queens have now become like the holy grail of bluffing hands and the suited jacks and things like that our bluffing range has just gotten a lot weaker um, where are we at here just to remind myself yes yeah, so we've got this whole like square here of hands to probably work with I mean, suited so tens are kind of meh, but there you go. You can see that our three bet range is becoming a lot weaker. Do we want it to be this week? I think it's fine for it to be this week because it wouldn't even be like totally unfeasible to start flying like Jack Five suited against the men open, depending on how good the guy is post slop and things. We've also got our um, in this range here. We've got some suited connectors at the bottom that we're not. They're still a little bit too weak to flat with, so we can add those right now. How many combos have we got? We've got 12, 16, so we've actually got like too many combos here. We wanted 14 of them to have 56, so let's get rid of these junky 10s. So now we've got our bad suited connectors and we've got our queen X suited and our jack X suited, and that's a good way of balancing with our value. Again, we've achieved what we set out to achieve at the start, which was to have an even number of, even ratio of value hands to bluff hands in our three bet range. So that his 4 bet bluffs don't work the 58% they need to, they only work like half the time. And we've expanded our calling range to play effectively against the min rays. And those are going to be our default ranges against the min rays. So how do these two differ? They differ substantially because they're they're actually very different. Um, the range in hand 1 was fairly tight for the flatting range because the spectrum was shifted a bit to the right and higher standards were in place if you like. We needed higher standards in order to... I wish I hadn't ruined this now. Maybe I can do some magic and get rid of all that. Yeah, let's get rid of all that. Cool. So, am I not just a genius? I'm getting better at this, guys. I'm not such a technophobe anymore. I can delete things. Cool. So, in the case where we were against the 3x, this yellow band, you know, is very, is fairly small. And the beauty of this is that the, the orange band and the green band here, for anyone who's colorblind, that's the 3-bet bluff band and the 3-bet value band. These two are going to be the same all the time. These haven't changed based on the sizing. They don't need to change. Sometimes you do want to be 3-betting more against a bigger open because it's just more profitable. But you don't have to. And if you've got like a strategy in place here, the main thing that should change is that you're calling a lot more hands. And that then impacts the rest of your ranges. But all that's happening here is that these ha hands are coming out of this fold band. And... They are pushing the hands all the way up this way in like this kind of a stream. So when we start min raising, all the hands start swimming like fish, like swimming. This is gonna be a fish. Um, man, how do I make a fish? Okay, fish, right? Swimming up the stream um, towards the the call hands, and they they stop here. There's like a wall here. They're not gonna get any further. They're not gonna get into the 3-bet value range necessarily, but they are going to get into the call range it's going to have this knock-on effect. So these two ranges here, um, this one and this one, are staying the same size, it's just the components of this one are different, and this one is growing and this one is shrinking, and that's kind of what happens. It's a good way to think about it, I like the spectrum, it's very illustrative of what's actually going on in these kind of situations. So. So that's how the ranges differ between one and two. And let me let me know what you think of this population read for 50 and L. This used to be the case. Um, it may not be anymore. Maybe people have wisened up and don't adjust in such dramatic, horrible fashion anymore. But if they do, then this kind of strategy and these ranges I've outlined there are going to be pretty nice. And you can play about with this. Now I've shown you guys how to design ranges in this sort of GTO style. You can sort of practice doing it yourselves and work out what is optimal against different player types, different sizings, different positions um, based on considerations like the spectrum and 
other kinds of things. But we're getting flying now in this series, like we're starting to make really cover some ground, which is good. Um, next time is going to be, we're going to talk about like attacking under the gun in middle position opens. I think like this is something that people don't really do that much, even at like 25 and 50 no, no limit, it doesn't happen that much. So I think someone left a comment in one of my vids previously saying that being 25 and L they thought it was about doing A, B, a, B and C, but also D, E and F, where D and F are, you know, a bit more advanced things. Well, let's say that three betting against early position opens is one of those things that we can definitely do a lot more of. People don't do enough. So I want to go over some default ranges for doing that next time for sure and then talk about linear three betting. How do we target the people who love the flat? Right now, we've mainly been, been looking at people who four bet a lot or people who fold a lot. So we're going to look at people who flat a lot and decide what the best way is to actually deal with them. And that should be fun. So that's pretty much all I've got time for today, um, or all I've scheduled in. Remember these guys. Um, you should be coming. This guy is now, as you guys are watching, is becoming better and better at understanding ranging. And he's about to stick it to this smarty pants guy that doesn't actually know what he's talking about. He's just sort of running his mouth about stuff. So that's going to be fun when this guy can. This guy represents all of you, he embodies the Grinder School population, and he's about to learn how to do all of this, and he's getting there um, by watching this, this series. So three more episodes left, um, we're going to do some post swap stuff in episode 5, and some live play in episode 6, and that should be fun. So right now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Um, good luck implementing all of this stuff at the tables. I know it's not easy at first, um, but practice it and memorize it, I guess, like off off the tables is the best way to go about this really, and just sort of go from there. There's a kind of short video, I'll make sure the next one has a bit more stuff scheduled into it, and I'll maybe try and pace it a bit better so I don't rush through it um, so much. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed anyway, and leave me your feedback as always, thanks very much.